Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Mash and Drum Whiskey Room on a very special Whiskey Wednesday night here on the Mash and Drum. Uh, I told you I wasn't lying. He's here. He's in studio. Uh, this is Mr. Ian Sturzman, Master Distiller of Ross and Squibb. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I've, uh, I've seen the show several times, so I'm uh, honored to be on it. Uh, oh, you have watched the show. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's watched. He's watched the show. <laughs> awesome. Uh, what is going on, everybody? Welcome in. Uh, obviously, we're going to be talking all things Ross and Squibb, um, MGP, whatever you want to call it tonight uh, here on the Mash and Drum. We got some uh, pretty cool offerings we're going to taste through. We're going to taste. We're going to talk a little bit about Ian's background, how, you know, he his path to becoming Master Distiller, uh, one of the largest distilleries on the planet. Um, on top of that, you know, talking about some of the um, maybe some of the upcoming things. That they're working on maybe they can't talk too much about it but we'll see what we can get out of ian a little bit um and you know the future the, the past the present the future of uh mgp slash ross and squib see where they're going see where they've been and it should be a pretty informative uh, stream tonight i have a bunch of my own questions that i'll be asking ian but I, as always guys we'll definitely leave a lot of time for you guys to ask your own uh if ian can uh, can answer those questions so um let's uh say hi to a couple people in the chat who do we got so far? We have James Lay. He says, first, I win. Thanks, James. Uh, Joey B is here. What's going on, Joey? Lucas Appenier is in the house. William Wiley, Mamuka 1977, Sandeep Chima. How are you doing, Sandeep? Warren Smith is here. Jeffrey Jankovic is here. Uh, Michael S. Whiskey Dirge uh, in the house as well. Uh, EJ, what's going on? Say hi to MJ and say hi to Lily, of course. Um, Lily is the beautiful bulldog there on the bottom left. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Waltz is here. What's going on? Uh, Shemi is in the house. What's going on, Shemi? Russ L is here. Uh, that's me. Tim, still gorgeous, is here. What's going on, Tim? Uh, Tim Cornet is also here. Uh, Jeffrey, oh, said hi to you already. Danny Lynn is here. What's going on, Danny? Dr. Sped in the house. Ethan F. Uh, we have Larry 3R. We have Josh Fritz. Uh, let's see. Jeff Perkins is here. What's going on, Jeff? Nice to see you. Uh, Michael Speakerman in the house. JG is here. Travis Robeson. What's going on, Trav? Uh, let's see. Roscoe P. Coltrane's in the house. Four Leaf Whiskey. What is going on, Stacy? Nice to see you as always. 96 Millie Man. Shauna Marie D. Always in the house. What's going on, Shauna? Nice to see you. Mr. Mom 310 is here. Ben Dramon. What's going on, Ben? Uh, Liddy Casanova. What's going on, Liddy? Uh, let's see who else. EMC is here. Chris Buzalencia. A uh, bunch of more people coming in. Boyd, Mason Lake, Sagamore Cast Strength here. Cheers. Uh, let's see here. More people coming in. Josh Randall, Whiskey Juice. The juice is loose. There's MJ. Nice to see you, MJ. Uh, Bob Glass is here. The father himself is here. Doug Pearson. Uh, let's see. Black Bourbon Families in the house. What's going on? Jason and Brandy are here. Big O201. Uh, Jay Porter's here drinking some Rima 7. Very nice. Mr. Mushnick in the house, tuning in from San Antonio. Hope everyone's doing well. Sipping on some Ranger Creek Point Thirty Six tonight. Smoking Firewaters here. Daniel Sutherland and a bunch more people coming in. Kevin Zachary says, welcome, Ian. Uh, Bill Mills here as well. So, oh, first super chat of the night. Ian is fantastic and a whiskey nerd like all of us. Whiskey cheers. Jay, Jay is the one that connected us by email. Uh -huh. You had spoken to him yeah. and he mm -hmm. yeah, connected us. So thanks mm -hmm. to JG for making this happen. <laughs> Um, loving the Penelope nine year. Very good. Uh, Copper Wolf 87 say, Oh, what's going on? Copper Wolf. Nice to see you, man. And that's about it. More people coming in here. So, so you're from Cincinnati, uh, originally from Dayton. Originally. I'm sorry, Dayton. That's right. But you live in Cincinnati now. Live in Cincinnati. All yeah. right. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your path to becoming master distiller, master distiller, one of the biggest, uh, brands in the land. Yeah, um, <laughs> unfortunately, my my story of how I got here is is not that interesting. But <laughs> it's not I uh, I grew right. up in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, I, I went to school for chemical engineering at Ohio University. Okay, um, got a minor in in biology, and then when I got out of school, I started working at a paper mill just south of here in Chillicothe, oh. Ohio. Okay, um, and, and I I really liked the paper making process, but I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do forever. And uh, I started looking, I wanted to move a little bit closer to home. Uh, I started looking kind of in the Cincinnati area. And it just happened to be that a recruiter called me about a job at a distillery just outside of Cincinnati. 
at a company I'd never heard of called MGP. <laughs> and, um, okay. and at the time I wasn't, I wasn't into whiskey. I wasn't searching a career, uh, in whiskey. So you weren't seeking out any job in the whiskey business at all. Not, no, no, no it okay. wasn't, it never really crossed my mind. I mean, uh, okay. in school, I, I was in a beer brewing club. I like to do homebrew. Um, so when they called with a job in a distillery, I thought it sounded really cool and I uh -huh. took it pretty much right away. I started off as a shift manager, uh, just kind of managing the distillery on the off shifts. And then, um, I did that for a year and then I was a process engineer for a year. And at the time, um, our master distiller was a guy named Greg Metz. I'm sure a lot of your listeners know that name. He's a pretty big name in the industry and he had a lot of experience. Um, but after him, there was a big gap in experience at the distillery at the time. So they created a position called the fermentation and distillation manager. And, uh, me and another gentleman filled that position and they moved us around, uh, the distillery kind of learning from Greg, I managed our, our mashing and distillation. Uh, so how long for so, a couple of years? So how long did you work under Greg before he left to go to Old Elk? Um, it was just a few years. Few years. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean that's a pretty decent amount of time. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say like six months and then he was gone. Oh okay. no, no, it was a few years. Okay, okay. And and then um, I kind of moved around managing each department of the distillery. During that time, Greg moved on and a guy named Gordon Working, who had been in the industry for a very long time, took his role. So I worked under Gordon for a few more years. And then I, I believe Gordon retired in 2018 or 19. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, we kind of went to a master distiller by committee. Um, so there was three of us kind of technical leads. They named master distiller. Um, the distillery is massive and it's very complex. So it, it's really not a job that one person can do. Yeah, because so you guys that, aren't you guys are just making you're not just making whiskey over there, right? Yeah, we yeah, we make, make it all. You make a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so um so we filled that with a committee and that made sense because of the complexity of the distillery. But then in 2021, when we acquired Luxco, we wanted to focus more on our own brands. We wanted somebody to really spearhead um, our brands be kind of the creative control of our brands and focus on the quality of our brands. And that's uh, when I went into the role I'm in now. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I know there was kind of like that big announcement when MGP bought Luxco. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, it's like, oh, so is this, they, they want some of those barrels or is it a, like to help marketing or, but it sounds like it was kind of multifaceted, mm -hmm. a little bit of everything. Yeah. Uh, so we're starting tonight here with the, uh, the Remus bourbon. Now the new Remus labels actually look like the highest rye, but, um, I haven't seen any of the new labels in Ohio quite yet. So we have the old school one, George Remus, um, crazy bourbon figure in history. Uh, one of the craziest stories I ever, I think I talked about on the channel when I did the review, um, you know, just his whole pathway. I mean, he's basically the guy that invented, the uh was it when you when you plead insanity yeah like mm -hmm. as a you know if you're in a court case like i don't know you murdered someone you <laughs> went crazy what do you do you plead insanity to try to get you know a lesser sentence or try to get out of it and george remus actually came up with that entire mindset which people still use today he actually tried to use it for himself when he had his wife murdered uh which is pretty crazy <laughs> so it's a crazy story if you guys have not um checked out my review. Uh, I think it was the Remus, the Remus Volstead um, review I did. I think I went through the whole story. I have to remember, but it's a crazy story. Um, Adam Hinn said, some of the Remus picks I've had have been insane good. Now you talked a little bit about this. You're trying to build up that single barrel program, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, um, we do uh, our single barrel programs a little different than others because we do like three different mash bills. Mm -hmm. So we offer each of the three mash bills, kind of the two that we use in the Remus 94 there, and then the one we use in the highest drive as well. Uh, let's see. So tell us a little bit about the history of MGP. I mean, founded in 1847, Seagram's bought at the time when it was Rossville Distillery in 1933, Sam Bronfman, who I don't know if you guys know the that special whiskey that comes out every year, Mr. Sam, that's basically named, named after Sam Bronfman. Um, kind of a few more owners along the way. Uh, then MGP buys a distillery in 2011. 
um, and then obviously changes to Ross and Squibb. So tell us a little bit about the changeover in the history and then moving from, I guess, MGP, Midwest Grain Products, to Ross and Squibb. Mm -hmm. So M MGP actually started in 1941 out in Atchison, Kansas. 41. Okay. But it, uh, our distillery in L Lawrenceburg, our history goes back to 1847. Got it. So, um, okay. that makes and, sense. and that's, and that ties into why we changed the name to Ross and Squibb because, you know, our distillery was actually originally two different distilleries. Okay. And the, the first one of those distilleries was the Rossville Union Distillery. That started in 1847. All right, so the and, Rossville started in 1846. So we're talking about mm -hmm. two separate locations. Uh, they were adjacent to each other. Adjacent, okay. So they had a, a border together. <laughs> okay. Um, but two different distilleries. So the, the Rossville distillery started in 1847, uh, and that actually burned down in 1933, right before Seagram's bought it. So it, it burned down all but one rickhouse that we're still using. And Seagram's came in in 1933, rebuilt the whole distillery, um, really everything that we're still operating today was mostly built by Seagram's and Seagram's had it all the way up until 2002 when the uh, mm -hmm. third generation Brofman kind of decided he wanted to get into the movie making business and really uh, got and, into movies, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and divest from his, uh, Seagram's empire in the spirits world. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, we got sold to Pernod Ricard. We were Pernod Ricard yeah, Pernod from Ricard. 2002 to 2008. Um, and then we were sold again. We were LDI uh, from 2008 to 2011. And then in, in 2011, MGP came in and bought us. Um, and then that that Squib distillery was um, on the northern part of our campus now. That started in 1869. It would operate through Prohibition. It was actually owned by George Remus during Prohibition. It was barrels from the Squibb Distillery really? that, that got him sent to prison. Um, <laughs> That's freaking awesome. And, and, well, not awesome, but not <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and then after Prohibition... Um, so wait, he owned that distillery? Yes. How did he even come to own a distillery? He owned quite a few distilleries. He did? Yeah. And he... Oh, yeah, that's right. Because in the story, mm -hmm. he was delivering barrels, and then he was hijacking his own barrels so yeah. he could sell them... Mm -hmm. you know, in the underground. Yeah, because okay. he owned pharmacies. He yeah, was a he owned pharmacist. A yeah, he was a pharmacist. So he, <laughs> he owned distilleries to to pull whiskey out for yeah. pharmaceutical purposes. Yeah. 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 And then, um, yeah, that, that, that Squibb distillery would eventually, after Prohibition, get bought by Shenley. It became yeah, the old, old Quaker distillery, mm -hmm. and that operated into the 1980s, um, and then we purchased that in the 2010s. We don't do any distilling up there. Um, we use those old Shenley Rick houses for maturation. I was going to say, so you're just using the Rick houses for aging purposes. Mm -hmm. Are huge differences between aging there versus other areas? Um, like is the, are the, cause you know, we talk about different profiles of single barrels all the time, especially, I mean, you look at, you know, Russell single barrel from Turkey, everyone like Turkey fans like me, like we focus in on the different rick houses and what those flavor profiles are mm -hmm. Do you get that a lot throughout the different locations from mgp there's definitely going to be differences in different locations and we have a lot of different styles of rick houses but um the neighbors uh, of shenley and seagram's and then even the original rossville rick house that are still on site are uh -huh. all constructed very similarly so they were all um Six story concrete and steel buildings with brick, wow, concrete and steel with, with brick. brick exteriors. Okay. Uh, with four lathes of brick deep. Yeah, <laughs> man. That's, they're that's, built like that's old school. They built yeah. like forts. Mm -hmm. They're built like forts. Any reason why they were built like that compared to? So I've heard that Seagram's built those um, rick houses like that with the idea that they could contain a fire to a floor. Now, I don't know if that's true. We I'm just going to say, it. It. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't but, that theory. <laughs> but there is, there's about, you know, four and a half foot of concrete in between every floor. So wow. they're, they're not floor to ceiling. Like you see in some of the traditional Kentucky ricks there, so, there's six, six high, the ricks go six high to a floor and the six floors. So high. when you walk in the first floor and you look up, you can't see any other barrels up there. Like you nope. have to go to the second floor to see those. Oh, yes. that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know how that uh, – yeah, don't test that theory. Mm -hmm. Don't test that yeah. theory. Uh, I want to say hi uh, to – this is my bourbon podcast is here. What is going on, Perry? Not sure the last time I made on one of these, but hello, everyone. Nice to see you, Perry. 
Uh, let's see. Chris Garner's here. A spirited life in the house. What's going on to the Vascos? Gary Franchi is here. Drifting Drams is here. What's going on? That's uh, Ethan and Katie. Uh, Vinny Campanella is in the house. Just pick up Penelope 15 year American light whiskey. So I had to crack it over. I'm seeing a ton of great reviews. Um, amazing history. Keep it alive. Um, that is making the Ross and Squibb name more legit. Thanks for the history. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think a lot of these distillers, you know, will willy nilly just pick a name, just to pick a name. There's a lot of, I mean, if you go, I mean, Ian just kind of talked about a lot of different history that even, you know, even in my research, didn't really know about quite yet. So kind of seeing that separation uh, and where the names came from, is pretty fascinating. Uh, let's go to, let's see here. So back in January, 2021, we touched on this a little bit. MGP agreed to uh, acquire American whiskey maker Luxco um, in a deal valued at 475 million. Then in May last year, Luxco, your subsidiary acquired 100% of the equity of Penelope, which someone just brought up. Um, you know, how has both those acquisitions either already made an impact at Ross and Squibb? So in my opinion, the the three companies have kind of been a, a perfect marriage because, you know, at MGP, um, before these acquisitions, I think, you know, we were one of... If not, I mean, I would put us right up there with anybody in terms of whiskey making expertise okay. and the assets we had to make that whiskey. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have a lot of experience in branded spirits. So when we acquired Luxco, we got <laughs> a lot of experience in branded spirits. They, they make their own great whiskey as well. Um, but we we picked up that that expertise in branded spirits. We picked up that sales team, um, those relationships with the distributors nationwide. And a lot of that sales team is really pretty like seasoned industry veterans um, with a lot of knowledge. And then when we move on to um, to last year getting Penelope, um, Mike and Danny add their own flair. You know, they do a lot of interesting finishes and blends and, yeah. and kind of think outside the box. They definitely do. Um, Mike and Danny are great, by the way, if they're watching to see you guys. <laughs> But then, but then they brought their team with them too, and mm -hmm. their team's um, passion is unmatched. And they're really whiskey lovers first, and and a lot of them are not industry vets. Uh, they're whiskey <laughs> yeah. lovers. They're whiskey lovers. They just that, want to be part of it. They were wanting to be part of it, and they were finding a way to grow that brand and, and doing it really successful. Mm -hmm. um, so they kind of have these kind of new school tactics. Um, so you add that that whiskey making expertise that MGP already had, and then the branded spirits expertise, um, and and some of the kind of old school industry veterans, and then you bring in the the passion and the kind of new thinking of the Penelope team, and it's it's created uh, quite a formidable team. I, I think. was going to say, I'm, it's, uh, it's excited a nice, for it's, it's, for what's next. It's a nice mix of seasoned veterans with newbies coming in that just want to. Mm -hmm. you know get in the business but also love whiskey yeah mike and danny their their energy is infectious when you talk to them especially mike i mean you talk to mike and he's just he's like he's all over the place but at the same time he's he's got such great ideas and danny is a super talented blender as well uh big vic mm -hmm. back big vic's backyard it's rigged cheers y'all questions why the law firm name not keep mgp name <laughs> we just <laughs> talked about that big vic you missed it you're gonna have to rewind buddy um, and I got to say too, that, uh, you know, with that, with these acquisitions, our, our talent pool has gotten stronger too. I think our leadership has gotten stronger. You know, our, our, uh, our CEO, David Bratcher is mm -hmm. actually, was actually the longtime president of Luxco. So, uh, um, oh, okay. you know, his leadership's been incredible, you know, hopefully he's watching. So I get these brownie points, but, uh, yeah. but give him a raise already. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, the whole, the whole thing has been a really good marriage. I can't think of a better way for three companies. No, because I think one of the things that, you know, even as, uh, you know, whiskey tubers and even, you know, talking to the audience I'm talking to now, one thing we always said, even bef before the acquisitions, when Remus kind of, when was Remus released, like the, the bourbons, the first? The first? So we actually bought that brand. Yeah. Um. So it was a very small kind of local brand in Cincinnati. And they were um, they were buying whiskey from us, and then we bought that when it was pretty fledgling 
um, you know, in, in large part because of the, the connection we had with the history of George Remus. For sure. Um, and then shortly after that, we released the first of the repeal. It was originally the 94 proof. And then we released the first of the repeal and we're, we're getting ready uh, for number eight this year. So it was about nine, eight, nine yeah, years ago. Eight, nine years. So that brand. Cause, cause even in the beginning mm -hmm. when, when people were talking about and I mean, you guys know in the chat, I mean, how much have we talked about Remus one through five, how amazing those batches were, but it's almost like not enough people knew about them just because like the marketing was, it's like, okay, what are they trying to market here? Why are no, why is nobody really kind of thinking about this stuff? Nobody's really talking about it. It's kind of a under the radar type of brand. So we feel like, I mean, at least I felt like when Luxco came into the fold for, uh, with, uh, MGP, Ross and Squibb, then Penelope's in the fold. I'm like, oh man, these guys are making moves here to really kind of build that umbrella of, of brands that you guys have and really kind of get more of your name out there. I mean, I mean, we're going to get into it a little bit here, but obviously so many brands are using you for sourced whiskey that do you feel like that makes it harder for your own whiskey to stand out from the pack? Um, that's a good question. I, I think sometimes, um, you know, it's a unique challenge um, that we have because we are, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say competing, but yeah. kind of competing, you know, on the shelf with, um, with people that are buying our whiskey. So it's, that's unique to us um, mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. It's, I, I was, I always felt like that's kind of, that's gotta be a unique challenge sometimes because, because mm -hmm. then people are taking the MGP whiskey and they're like either double barring it or throwing it in a finish and just doing a lot of different stuff with it. So I could see that competition for your own stuff being a little bit challenging. Uh, wow. Joseph Brazzers is here. What's going on, Joseph? Nice to see you. Uh, Tiller's bourbon challenge in the house, 300 people watching. Thank you guys so much for hanging out tonight. Um, uh, who flung guns got the Gatsby out tonight. Very, very <laughs> nice. Um, I did want to go back to a, uh, let's see. Drifting drams here with buddy Ethan. He's been a huge uh, proponent of trying the Remus Highest Rye. He, he loves it. He's the one that kind of turned me on to it. And then when I got to try a bottle, uh, which is right here, this is like one of my kind of sleeper bourbons that I don't think enough people um, uh, pay attention to. I mean, obviously, you have to have like a little bit more spice and a higher rye content in your bourbon. But I think some of the flavors in there get really, really good. Um, so... The internals of MGP aren't discussed very much. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no tours really. It's kind of a closed door secret. How big is it really? So, <laughs> so we uh, we're publicly traded, and we don't officially state our capacities. We've never put out a public statement about our capacities. But I can tell you uh, what we do say is we're one of the top five whiskey producers in the country. Um, the site is about 80 acres and it's a little over a mile from, uh, where you come into the distillery to our North Rick house. Um, and, um, that's pretty big. Yeah, it's very big, <laughs> That's pretty but, big. but it's unique because, uh, you kind of touched on this earlier, but for a distillery, our size, we are so much more complex and versatile because mm -hmm. most other whiskey distilleries anywhere close to our size are going to make, you know, somewhere one to four mash bills and they're going to crank those out all day long. So we're doing, we do a lot of gin. We do a lot of vodka. We do light whiskey. We, you know, are the leading producer of rye whiskey. We make a lot of bourbon and we do about, uh, last year we did about 20 different whiskey mash bills in total. So we're, we're doing we're very versatile for how big we are. 20 different mash bills? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. But you guys only really release a certain amount of your brand. The Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. Um, let's see here. Uh, Remus Single Barrel Store Picks. I have a flavor that's really solid all the way through. Great flavors. Um, hey, Mr. Jigs is here. What's going on? Mark Emmenecker is here. Cheers all. Love some Remus Single Barrel Store Picks. People love the store picks, man. I think it's going around. Um, <laughs> So we just answered this question you said about, well, so you make about 20 different mash bills. Your grain, your rye, mostly. Um, I know a lot of rye grain for different distillers comes from Europe. Is that the same case with your 95.5 rye? 
For the most part, for the most part. So um, we do get the majority of our rye from Germany and Sweden. Um, Interesting. Seagram's did a lot of research in the mid nineties and that's kind of when that, that started. Okay. Um, but we continue to do a lot of research. So we're not getting everything from Europe right now. We, we do trial a lot of different ryes. Uh, we do a lot of, we've done a lot of research into varieties of rye. We look at, um, you know, certain compounds we're looking for in the rye grain and we, we can measure that and look at those levels in different varieties. So we're, we're doing a lot of work around sourcing rye and we're constantly evaluating that. But, um, but at this moment, most of our rye is still coming from Germany and Sweden. Has there been a shift from those areas where you, so would you say Germany and Sweden? Mm-hmm. So those, the climates, the, um, you know, I mean, you want to talk about either climate change, non-climate change, whatever's happening in those areas over the course of time. Have you seen changes to the grain in the last 10 to 20 years or has the research showed any of that? Um, yes, we have seen changes in the grain. I mean, <clears throat> you're going to get changes in the grain from season to season, right? Just because yeah. of the crop years. Um, and then probably the bigger impact um other you know bigger impact than climate change is the the farmers are changing the grains that they're putting in the ground oh interesting um okay so so you know there was oh i want to say i want to say it wrong i want to say it was 2017 or 18 there was a pretty big drought in that area and so you know if you're a farmer you're gonna and you're gonna put the most drought resistant, um, pest resistant, the highest yield in the field crop you can find. For sure. Makes and, the most money. For sure. And the, you know, the KWSs of the world are developing the, those hybrid strains to do the, those things. Um, so we have to keep up with, with what's being planted, how that's impacting our flavor. Um, and, and, and that's a constant struggle, but, uh, <laughs> but we're, we're constantly evaluating it. Oh, that's interesting. That's good. You know, it's, it's just always good to see that distillers are a kind of, that's like some of the stuff that you just don't hear about, like distillers doing, like everyone just thinks like it's made the same way, but to keep your quality assurance up, you have to constantly be checking this stuff to make sure that your the outcome of your product is always going to be, you know, legendary, like the 95.5. How did the 95.5 rye mash bill become so legendary? Was so, it, was it a Larry Ebersol thing? Was it a Greg Metz? Like, how the hell did 95.5 rye become like the mash bill standard so, for rye whiskey? So interestingly enough, it wasn't like the original Seagram's rye mash bill. Um, I've read a lot of the old trials um, in our, we have all the documents still down in our engineering room. And a lot of them refer to an, an 88% rye, 12% malted barley. Um, but at, at some point, you know, probably as commercial enzyme um, technology advanced and malting technology advanced, they they lowered that percentage of malted barley <laughs> down from, okay. from 12 to 5. Because I, I know Greg Metz loves high percentages of barley, especially mm -hmm. in his bourbon that he uses. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was just curious, like, but, out of all the – so it did go through some transitions. There was a higher barley – rye whiskey out there before 95.5 came along. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But I, I think the the reason it's become legendary, your words, not mine, <laughs> uh, but I like them, <laughs> um, it is probably a lot just the, the history of rye whiskey in our country um, and our kind of role in that history. Because, you know, at the the birth of our country, you know, most of the colon before we declared independence, most of the colonies were producing rum. Mm -hmm. uh, when we declared independence, you know, Britain cut off those trade routes for us to get rum from the Caribbean, uh, sugar producing colonies. And, and at that same time, settlers were just moving, you know, into Western PA and, and Maryland, and they found the soil there very good for growing rye but it was hard to move those rye crops back across the Allegheny Mountains to the population centers. So they started distilling it. It was a lot easier to move a barrel of whiskey than, you know, a thousand pounds of rye. Um, and, and rye kind of quickly took rum's place as the spirit of choice and was really remained very popular up until prohibition. And during prohibition, 
Rye kind of fell to the wayside. Um, people didn't prefer rye whiskey. They wanted a lighter spirit, a more he heavily rectified spirit during Prohibition. So a lot of the rye whiskey distilleries, um, the Eastern distilleries, never reopened their doors after Prohibition. Yeah. A lot of the ones that did fell to the wayside pretty quickly after. But our distillery under Seagram's was always making, you know, that 8812 or that 95.5 rye as a key component to a lot of the Seagram's blended whiskeys. So, you know, when 2010s rolled around and bourbon was getting more popular, people's palates were getting more sophisticated, you know, the cocktail culture was coming up, all those things kind of made people seek out rye whiskey again. Uh, we were sitting there with, you know, decades of experience in making it and age stock. So I think that's kind of why and that's that where that's where it all came off. from. Yeah. yeah, that's that's cool insight. I love that. So you guys, again, I told you guys, you're going to get all the history today. It's going to be cool. All right. What are we, what are we trying next? Uh, let's try the highest rye next. Highest rye. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. So tell us a little bit about the highest rye, why you brought this one to the market. So, so everything we've done with the Remus brand before the highest rye has been one of our two, um, kind of historic bourbon mash bills that we've been doing since way back in the Seagram's days. And that's our, our LESV and our LBSV, which is our 21% rye and 36% rye bourbons. Um, this is a, a brand new, well, brand new, six years. Um, six years. <laughs> a brand new mash bill um, that we just started making you know, about seven years ago. This is the oldest of what we have. And it's, um, it's the first time we use malted rye in a mash bill. And it's it's 51% corn, so it's a bourbon, and it's 39 rye and 10% malted rye, so it's 49% rye bourbon. Um, but to me, it doesn't. It's not as rye forward initially as you would think a 49% rye bourbon would be. Would, like, you, would you attribute that to the malted rye aspect of it? I think so. Yeah. 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 The the malted rye softens it up a little bit, and also like the the enzyme bouquet in malted rye is going to be slightly different than the enzyme bouquet in uh, malted barley. So it's going to break down different parts of the grain, release, um, you know, different organic acids and things into solution. That's going to create, you know, slightly different flavors. Dude, I love the, fl I love like that chocolate malt ball flavor. I get in this one too, mm -hmm. a little bit. It's just really, and yeah, and, and I think you hit it on the head. It's not as spicy it's um it's a little bit more rounded it's not as in your face it's not as herbal as you would think like if anyone thinks that this highest rye is is you're going to get the experience of a 95.5 rye if you have a little bit of like an aversion to rye whiskey especially 95.5s this does not drink like that it drinks more kind of chocolatey a little bit richer a lot less like herbal quality to me on this yeah. it's a little bit more rounded no i think that's is this is that was that your vision with this one when you were um well you didn't develop this in the beginning no so okay. so when this was originally distilled i would have been kind of uh on the team tasked with making it run in the distillery oh okay but i did not come up with this mash bill but i is think this, is this a greg metz uh no so this mash bill was actually um uh came up with that's not right but um uh <laughs> but, invented by yes, yeah. uh, the person that that made this mash bill um was is our director of quality a guy named david whitmer oh okay um cheers to david Guy show yeah name. so he came up with the mash bill and then we were tasked with with running it in the distillery um but i think you know a lot of the reason he um came up with it was that you know we we do have such a leadership in making rye whiskey so with a new bourbon mash bill, we wanted to take that that rye influence to the max. Uh, let's see here. Um, so I did see some questions kind of popping in the chat. Uh, guys, I will get to your questions, I promise. Just trying to get through all mine here before um, he, you know, we pepper him with all your questions. I did see a bunch show up. Really good questions, by the way, so just keep them coming. Um, when I'm ready for them, I'll ask you guys to kind of tag me and we can start asking Ian a bunch of different questions. Um, all right. So since you're a publicly traded company, I know you can't tell us a lot about what you're creating as far as, um, you know, NDPs, but I'm curious, 
can you talk about the the process nowadays? If if I'm an NDP, mm -hmm. I'm like MGP. I need help. I need you. I had this idea for a mash bill, or I've looked on your menu of a million mash bills, and and this is what I want to make. Mm -hmm. What? How does that process start? What is it like? Are you guys taking numbers at this point? Is it still a 10 year waiting list? Is it a yeah. five year waiting list? Are you seeking out those people because maybe you have a vesting interest in a brand? Is it a culmination of all that? Like, how does that process even start, begin, and end? So, to be honest, I am not heavily involved in that process. Yeah. Uh, at the distillery. So, that is more of our distilling solution sales team. Um, but I, I would think that that it's harder today than it once was just because of the demand. Um, the For demand sure. has increased a lot. Um, we have in the past made um, kind of specialty mash bills for certain customers. Um, whether or not we will continue to do that in the future is, is not up to me. Um, you know, it, my role in that would probably be, you know, one of our sales guys would, would call me or, or Josh up and would say, you know, hey, will this run in the distillery? Do we even have the capability of making it? Um, and we would say, you know, yes or no. And then we would look at, you know, what are the, the costs of doing that? And um, and then from there, it would be in, in other people's hands. Okay. Um, no, because, yeah, I was just curious. I mean, so mm -hmm. many brands. I mean, I know you guys have a laundry list of brands uh, that, you know, you, you do source to, but or that people source from from you. But I'm just wondering, like, what that process is like. Um, let's see. All right. We talked a little bit about the Remus brand. Uh, we're going to get into the Rossville Union here in a little bit. But let's uh, take some questions here for a little bit before we move on to the Rossville Unions. Yeah. Uh, actually, before the questions, guys, let me... Just give you a quick reminder here. Next week, big week, guys. Um, Fred Minnick will be on the channel. The finale, Blemigeddon Whiskey Challenge number six, will be here. Um, we will now. This I've already posted the live, uh, the the live stream for this, so you guys can check out in the description of that live stream all the bottles that are up. And what I'm going to do here is I've created two different fundraisers. So the fundraisers, uh, as you guys know, I have a fundraiser that's going to be for St. Jude Children's Hospital, which is usually the one we do each and every year. And then I have a fundraiser that I'm going to be doing for locally here, Nationwide Children's Hospital. So two fundraisers through GoFundMe. Um, you could start heading there and donating now to get one of, my goodness gracious, uh, one of... 53, <laughs> one of 53 different chances, uh, one of 53 bottles or sample packs uh, to win. Actually, I think it's going to be 54. I, I did forget to put something in there. I think I need to, that I just remembered. So I'm actually going to drop these links here in the chat. If you guys want to start donating now, you can. I appreciate it. it it's going to be a hell of a, a, a of an event. You know, we have Eric Sawyer, the defending champion, uh, who's going to be in it? Can you know? Can Darrell take him down? Can I mean? It, it's going to be a, a pretty fun uh, back and forth here as Fred and I kind of go through this here, and we're going to uh, we have JG in the mix. Uh, can he take out the champ? It's going to be great. So uh, you may or may not see me in an ascot. I'm not promising anything, <laughs> but here are the two links, guys. If you want to feel like you want to start donating. Uh, and get in and I'll get in on it early before next week. Please feel free to do it. I'm going to be recruiting some people to follow the giveaways, but those are the two. Uh, those are the two different links that you could follow in order to donate to the Blenigan and fundraisers for St. Jude. So good luck. Thanks for being incredible. Thanks for uh, supporting uh, all the kids out there uh, that are you know fighting cancer, and um, we'll see uh, what we can raise this year. It should be a lot of fun. So. Yeah, and possibly me and an ascot, as I said. I'm not promising, but maybe. We'll see. Ian's going to tune in just to see me in an ascot. No, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so highest rye. Um, again, if you guys have not tried this one, probably one of my favorite sleeper bottles on the market. But um, one I did really want to get into here are the Rossville Union Rise, because I know a couple people in the chat did have some questions about them. 
Which one is this? Uh, we're going to try the... Oh, we're going to do this The one barrel first. proof. Oh, seven year. oh, we're going right yes. to the barrel proof? Okay. Yeah. So that was... That's, oh, that's this, a is single a, barrel. this is a single yeah. barrel pick? Mm -hmm. yeah. So are these kind of making them wear, their way out there in the market? Yes. Yeah. All right, guys. So if you guys have not seen the new Rossville Union labels, this is what they look like. Um, they're going to... They'll probably be out in the market. The... You want to grab that bottle? Uh, the old bottle. Yeah. So that's what the old bottle used to look like is this one. And then they had they had switched it up to this look now. Stands out a little more, a little bit skinnier. So I think, uh, would you say it's better for shelf space? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So I'm excited to try this. So this is a barrel proof 95.5, seven year. And, and this is readily available? Yes. Okay. So this is a shelfer. Yeah. It, um. And it is not, well, let's try it first, but it is not entirely <laughs> um, 95.5. Oh. It is predominantly 95.5. Got There it. is a very small percentage of the um, 51 rye, 45 corn, 4% multi All right. So, you, all right. A little bit of a, so kind of like what, like a little bit what Sagamore is doing a little bit with kind of the way they're blending, but you guys seem to be doing a little bit more than 95.5 in it. Yeah, so okay. with our with our kind of every day the ninety four proof um, Rossville, it's it's still predominantly ninety five five. Okay, but there's more of the fifty one in there. Okay, uh, where this one is, is almost all ninety five five. Almost like, all. Okay. Sprinkle in a, all right. a few. Sprinkle in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, let's try this one. Yeah, I like the old style bottle, but the new one is nice too. Definitely more shelf friendly. Says the Spirit of Life. Yeah, I agree. Uh, guys, while you're hanging out here, please hit the like button uh, if you could while you're hanging out. Show the uh, show the video some love. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. And thanks for tuning in tonight and listening to uh, me and Ian just ramble on about NGP history and some of the new stuff that they're working on. Um, ooh. I mean, I definitely get that herbal citrus quality on the nose. Well, let me give mm -hmm. it a try. Well, cheers real quick. Cheers. So come on, man. All right, here we go. Yeah, that doesn't finish like a typical 95.5. Mm. I, I, I kind of get that herbal quality in the front, but the finish is different to me. It's oh. a little sweeter. Oh, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Can, I can see that a little bit. To me, it's very um, it's very herbally, very like minty, dilly. Um, I get the dill on the mid palate mm -hmm. for sure. Have you... What's like your profile? I know this is one of the questions I wanted to ask. When you're when you're looking at making a let's say a rye blend, so when you're kind mm -hmm. of creating these, what's what's your go-to profile? Are you are you a big fan of the dill? Do you I, like that in your rye whiskeys? I you do. do like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I am. I know it's a, a little polarizing, but um, <laughs> but I'm a big fan of the dill, the mint, the kind of herbalness. Um, you know, I like the spice, but I I really like the mint, the dill, the herbal qualities. Um, yeah, this definitely has it for sure. Right. But see, I'm, I mean, maybe because I'm just, oh no, I got the dill there. There it is. Because it was, it was all citrus to me at first. Mm -hmm. I was getting a lot of orange, even like a lemon peel. And then all of a sudden it went herbal and dill, mm -hmm. like right there in the back end of that one. So if you guys like a dilly dilly, <laughs> that raw swing and barrel pool, that's pretty good. I'm generally not a dill fan, but that one actually isn't that bad. Mm -hmm. It actually has a nice balance with the citrus. It's not like, like I can't stand the ones that just taste like straight up pickle juice. I can't do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I actually kind of like those ones. But, <laughs> but. Of course you do. I don't know if you can distill that for the masses, though. Yeah, no. <laughs> Everybody likes to drink pickle juice. Uh, that sounds wonderful. Uh, shot. Let's see here. Uh, oh, thanks, Raging Irish, Irish friend. I appreciate that. Um, any any super chats I'm going to get either, whether it be tonight, uh, last week, uh, we got a good amount, and obviously anything that's, uh, that we do next week with Fred, those are all going to be um, uh, donated to Nationwide. So, so appreciate that, guys. Uh, all right. So 
before we get into you know a couple of other bottles here and keep going with the questions for Ian, I do want to get some questions uh, interdispersed for you guys. So you guys, please tag me in the chat here. Any questions you have, I'll try to get them to Ian as we drink uh, through some of these. So Ian's ready to die on that dill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. Here's an interesting question. Uh, compared to Jack Daniels, how much is your production of whiskey? Could you, do you even have like a, but you can't really get into like gallons on stuff. Yeah, right? I, I can't really say. Um, okay. We're one of the top five. I believe Jack Daniels is the top one. Top one, your top five. Yeah. yeah there you go. Uh, Nick Foles, what's your favorite non MGP bottle? So when you're not drinking MGP oh, all the time, man. what are you, what are you sipping oh. on? Are you, are you afraid your boss could get mad? Only drink no. MGP. <laughs> I have, but honestly, I, I've asked this question to probably every master distiller or even um, you know bourbon executive that's been on the show, and you'd be surprised of the amount of different whiskeys. Some people like to stay within their own brand because that's mm. what they're tasting every day, and they want to make sure they don't really. They want to make sure that if there's an issue with their whiskey, they could tell. Like, so they keep drinking it and they mm -hmm. just keep enjoying it. But then you have other folks that are on the other, on the complete flip side that want to try everything they can because they want to know what else is out there. Mm -hmm. So where are you at in that? Are you somewhere in the middle or do you still like to stay in the Ross and Squibb family? So I used to drink a lot of other whiskeys. Um, and I would say in the last three years mm -hmm. i almost exclusively drink our brands um and there wasn't really a reason for it um I, I don't know i don't know what exactly happened but i almost exclusively drink our other brands with the large caveat of um you know when i'm out at shows when i'm on the road okay. uh you know i always try what you know what other distillers are doing and and even you know like what rempy and, and beam and yeah of course doing. um yep but but um i predominantly drink our stuff um <laughs> I mean, but there's, I, not, there's nothing wrong with that and, but I, mean, I i do like other distilleries um you know i'm, I'm a big fan of four roses they do they were you know uh Former Seagram's Distillery, yeah, for as sure. Well. Um, that makes sense. They have a and, nice high ride, Nashville. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, um, and I like Wild Turkey. I like I like a lot of different things. I like um, I like a lot a lot of what some of the newer distilleries are doing. Um, a little bit more experimental stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, Frey Ranch is one that comes to mind. I like some of the stuff they're doing. Yeah, uh, with the with grains and, and rye specifically. So. so this is something that I've heard, and I would actually like to get your opinion on this. The master general, I've heard that the dill note is considered a faulty note and that MGP is leaning away from them. Any comment? Have you, is I, that something that, that you've, I've not heard that. You have not. <laughs> um, I like it. And, and, um, and it, it doesn't come up in the distillate very often um so when when we're evaluating new distillate to go into the barrel um that that dill note is not very prevalent so you're saying it's that the developed. dill note so when so it's a clean distillate it all the taste testers all good let's age it that will develop over time in the barrel for the most part for the most part sometimes you do get a hint of it in the distillate but mm -hmm. never like some of the okay coming out of the barrel hey that's fair mm -hmm. thanks for answering that let's see can you can you you have a kind of a number here how many barrels do you dump a day um or is that along the lines of how many do you fill a day that and you can't really say that i think that's uh too close but i will say that um no no i won't <laughs> <laughs> almost got him almost got him all right no problem um this is a great question. What trends in whiskey have you found um, that, you know, maybe you enjoy or maybe even some of the stuff that, you know, I'm not going to say that stuff that you guys could be exploring, but stuff that really interests you as far as whiskey trends. Is it finishes? Is it um, heritage grain mash bills? 
Is it, you know, utilizing different toast levels, char levels, really playing with barrels? What are some of the trends out there that you that kind of have piqued your interest? Um, I mean, a lot of the trends are really interesting. The one trend that interests me the most is is probably trying different heritage grains, um, really developing that connection with. Hey, I guessed right on that one. Heritage um, grains, <laughs> but but no, we. Uh, I'm interested in different coopers um, right at this moment. Um, you know, we. John Rempe does great finishes. Stephen Beam does great finishes. Mike and Danny do great finishes. Um, at this moment, that's not really what I'm focusing on with the Ross and Squid brands. Um, but Cause, yeah, cause somebody, some, yeah, somebody did ask mm -hmm. uh, um, a little, you know, a few minutes ago, or maybe even longer than that. Were there any finished varieties coming out of um, out of Ross and Squid anytime soon? And I feel like I don't know, I, like. I don't know if you guys need to do that. Like you said, you have mm -hmm. Penelope, you have uh, you have Luxco that have done more than enough finishes. Mm -hmm. That I feel like you guys have the stock where you can kind of you can kind of focus on really unique, delicious blends with the stocks that you have because you have these. God knows how high up in age their stocks go, that what they're sitting on. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the ability to kind of play around with that probably more than a lot of other people do is probably a kind of a an ace in the hole for you. Yeah. I mean, right now, um, I don't know that there's really anybody else out there that has as much to play around with us only because, um, you know, we're one of the biggest distilleries out there and, and our, our brands are, are growing, but they're not, you know, they're not huge brands yet. Yeah, so that's true. So we have the ability to be incredibly selective with what we're putting in. And out. plus you have, not only do you have, Age whiskey, but you have all these different mash bills that probably mm -hmm. not a lot of other people have. If you're lucky, some places will have three, four, maybe five mash bills, but mm -hmm. you guys have a whole menu of shit that you're working with, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Um, all right, let's see here. Do you have any pot stills or just column hybrid? That's a good question. Um, so we we will run um, our doublers or kettles occasionally as uh pot stills oh, okay um we don't really have like a what you would a traditional pot still but we'll run um batch distillations on our kettles occasionally we'll even run like a like a hybrid distillation um where we can power um you know a rectifier with a kettle Damn, dude, this is see. This is the more I go to this, it's getting more citrusy to me. It's it's kind of the dill's taking a little bit more of a backseat. Um, Silas Murray says, My current favorite is Old Forest for single barrels. Is there anything comparable you'd recommend around the same price? Around the same price, I mean, Old Forester. Well, Silas, there's a difference. You talking about the 100 proof or the barrel proof? There's a big difference there. The barrel proof. You have Woodford Reserve Barrel Proof, but that is, you know, that's 160. That's a lot, much double the price of the old Forester Barrel Proof. Um, I mean, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof, Larceny Barrel. I mean, I know Larceny Barrel Proof is a weeder, um, but there are some, there are a lot of barrel proof options out there as far as old Forester single barrel uh, with that mash bill. Um, uh, 1792 full proof, really good high proof bottle, uh, probably a younger distillate, just like old Forester. That might be the one that might be the most close that not a lot of people talk about because you're looking at that 18% mash bill just like Old Forester. So when you kind of do that comparison with Barton, it drinks a little hot. It's spicy. I think that's probably – that might be the most comparable as far as price point. You just don't see 1792 full per very often anymore. But uh, see, y'all think I was – say everyone thought I was going to say something different, but right? 1792 full proof pulling that out? That's right. Uh, let's see here. Can we ask, Ian, if there will be any future releases of the Volstead? Well, I think we kind of have the Volstead with the Gatsby. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it just kind of was just kind of rebranded to Gatsby, correct? Yeah. So the Volstead was a, a fourteen year, and then we've we've gone to fifteen with the yeah. Gatsby, but it's I, it kind of took the place of Volstead. It's kind of crazy too because I still have a uh, is this it? Yeah, guys, I still have an original Vols Volstead right here. Don't have much left of it, but this is one of the original Volstead bottles. 
um, that I found in my, uh, I didn't realize I had this little bit left here. So basically, if you could check this out, it's basically the same bottle shape. It was just mm -hmm. it was just rebranded. So Volstead is a well, Gatsby is essentially Volstead now. Mm -hmm. So yes. Um, let's see here. Uh, what excites you about the industry right now? And if you could share, what are you excited about that you have in the near horizon for Ross and Squibb? Now, yeah, I know I know you have to be a little bit cagey as far as like what you guys are working on, mm -hmm. but. Um, so what yeah. excites me about the industry is probably, um, you know, we are seeing distillers get more in tune with agriculture. We are, you know, we're heading towards, you know, trying more uh, different varieties with heritage grains, um, which I already talked about a little bit. And then also what excites me is our current team that I've already talked about. You know, the, yeah. I think that um, MGP is a much different company now with Luxco and with Penelope. And I think we're really positioned for success and that's exciting. As far as um, things to come out under the Ross and Squibb portfolio, um, we are working on a lot of different things. Um, unfortunately, I can't talk about them yet, but um, but there'll be some cool things coming out for sure. There are, wait, you said you can't talk about what yet? The mash bills? Um, can't talk about specific releases specific that releases. will be coming out yeah. with Ross and Squibb, but yeah. but we're working on things. Uh, Scott, do you have a favorite turkey bottle you like? <laughs> Not really. Not really. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, Burr Ben in the house, Whiskey Uncensored. What is your favorite mash bill, an age at MGP, distilled by your predecessors? Do you try to distill any of those flavor profiles or go out on your own? That's a really good question. If you um, if you had out of the menu of mash bills, you do you kind of have a favorite that you lean towards, both either past present. Um, probably all of my favorite whiskeys I've ever drank have been ninety five fives from us. Um, but I really like this highest ride mash bill as well. Um, and, and I obviously really enjoy our bourbons, but. My favorite mash bill is, is probably the 95.5. And, um, well, so you go all here, kind of old yeah. school, but you know, mm -hmm. okay, respect on that. We, we, well, we get an older version of Rossville, uh, similar to a Remus Gatsby Revolt set. So, this was actually a cool question. One of my patrons brought up as well. So, the Remus Volstead is like that 15 year bourbon. Will we mm -hmm. ever see a like a 15 year Remus Gatsby rye in there? That could be friggin' sick. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. um, He's already thinking about because he already yeah, I, he already kind of opened the box. He said that 95.5 rise is favorite, so I'm <laughs> yeah. gonna bet yes at some point. But he can't, probably can't say. <laughs> uh, we uh, we will see. We there, will see. I can't say right. Come now. on, you make this you make this box like you make this box like a dark hunter green with the gold. <laughs> then you open it. That could be pretty beautiful. I'm just saying. 95.5 rye. Come on, guys. I'm working for you here. I'm trying to make this shit happen. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, uh, so interesting question here, but you probably can't talk to this. Uh, do you have a Penelope other than producing the main beginning distillates? Because obviously Penelope has been sourcing from MGP for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I do want to talk about a mash bill that was distilled back in the 80s. And you guys seem to be sitting on a lot of it for a long time. And that's light whiskey. Mm -hmm. What has been your experience with light whiskey? The fact that it's kind of had a little bit of a, of a renaissance here in the last several years. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on light whiskey? Are you guys still doing more with it? Is it just really set aside for uh, people doing? I think it's a great blend component as well. Mm -hmm. You could kind of really bridge that gap between an older or a younger bourbon or even like a bourbon and a rye with a with the light whiskey if you use it right. But if you're, if you have all this light whiskey, are you guys distilling more of it? Is it just a bunch of stocks you have? What's, what's the, what's the light whiskey, the state of light whiskey at MGP? Um, <laughs> so yes, we still distill light whiskey. You still, you we, still do make it. Yes. We still distill light whiskey and light whiskey is, um, it's called light because it's light in congeners because we distill it up to a much higher proof. We distill it right up um right up close to 190 without getting to 190. Mm -hmm. um and 
and then it, it goes into used cooperage and barrel entry proof for us is 140. So a little higher barrel entry proof. Um, it was really made um, to be a component of, of a lot of blended whiskeys. Yeah. Um, and but, I, but I also read that it was also created because in the 80s when whiskey wasn't that popular, even early 90s, um, you know, these lighter, everybody was kind of shifting to uh, vodkas and mm -hmm. uh, drinks like that, kind of the clear spirits. Mm -hmm. So this was a way to kind of introduce a lighter type of, like, I remember in the beginning, people saw light whiskey, they thought it was like a lower calorie whiskey, which wasn't the case. <laughs> but it's actually more based on the color, because you're going in at a super high entry proof, high, um, basically to like a vodka type of proof off the still, mm -hmm. then you're getting put into a use cooperage rather than a new barrel. So it takes a lot longer to get that color. So it is a lighter whiskey, um, which was kind of made to compete with some of those vodka brands, wine coolers, whatever you want to talk about. But um, was it just the fact that light whiskey really didn't take off and then it was just kind of sitting around? So that's why we saw these like 15 to 16 year old light whiskeys come out of nowhere from, from Ross and Squibb? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think that potentially um yeah i mean there were there's been some really great expressions of of the light whiskey from us you know i think penelope's doing penelope a, did a great, great job one, with yeah. that yeah um but also i, I kind of think a little bit of it is um a lot of the whiskey community today is is pretty obsessed with proof and age and um so I'm a I'm a recovering proof whore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I used to. So you know when I'm doing a pick, I like to see a, a good proof on a whiskey. But once you get into like that 135, 140, even higher range, I'm like, Ugh, I, I don't know if I could like enjoy that most of the time. You know, we were talking about this earlier. I like to kind of live right now in that between 110 and 120 range. You give me something like 114 and 118. I just love that proof right now for most whiskeys, especially bourbon. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think people see a high proof and they just kind of go bananas. And mm -hmm. I don't know. You're, I, I just, just saying, just seeing the way you react to that. Not a big fan of the super high proofs for light whiskey. No, I just, um, you'd rather use it for a blend, maybe. No, um, I think there's been some really great expressions of our light whiskey um, on their own. The, the proof thing just kind of strikes a note with me personally um, because um, I think people focus in on it a little too much. Um, <laughs> to me, like there's kind of a disconnect where people think that like more proof equals more flavor, like higher proof equals more flavor. And, um, and that's, that's just not the case. So uh, a higher proof will impart a different character sometimes because as it sits in that barrel at a higher proof, it's going to um, to extract more alcohol solubles at a higher proof. But, you know, you're, you're splitting hairs a little bit there. Okay. Um, it's interesting. But, but people, I think, think this higher proof means more flavor because barrel proof whiskeys mean more flavor. Mean more flavor. Now, whether that barrel proof whiskey came out at 110 or 120 doesn't necessarily mean more flavor. I could pour 190 off the stills into this and I can promise you it will dilute the flavor. It will yeah. not make it more flavorful. The the ethanol is not what's driving the flavor. Now when you add water that was not in the barrel, um, then you're diluting the flavor. And I think that is kind of why this this um, higher proof more flavor thing kind of came from okay so well i mean that's a good explanation on kind of how because you know you have a lot more ethanol in the cask it's going to affect like you said a lot more of those those compounds within the bourbon because alcohol is a very volatile it's a very volatile uh, liquid mm -hmm. so it could do a lot to a to a whiskey inside that inside that cask mm -hmm. and affect it to a certain degree not meaning that if it comes out of the barrel you know, at a super high proof. I mean, it is going to be flavorful, but I think there's a fine line between just a lot of heat and ethanol versus a lot of flavor. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? Um, or is it kind of, or it is just, even, or is it even more of a, 
Yeah, what do you? What, yeah. It's kind of just that um, that I I think there is a a misconception <laughs> that, that higher proof means more flavorful. I think okay. that that misconception is is real within the industry. Uh, fifth quarter tailgate is here. What is going on? Nice to see you, Scotty. And we also have um, I thought I saw Beyond the Row is in the house. What is going on? Nice to see you guys. Beyond the Row, one of my favorite channels. I think that's is that Jamie? I think that's Jamie. Um, nice to see you, Jamie. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, so this is a question I want to ask, and a lot of people are asking about. Are you guys working on a single malt? Please tell me you are. Uh, you, are you working on an American single malt? We, yeah, we have. I know you have American single malt, but I'm saying like that you're going to lease under your, oh. like, a, like a like your own American single malt. Do does we have a we have no plans right now for a American single malt under okay. the Ross and Squid portfolio. Okay, got it. No plans. There right you now. go. Had to ask. Um, let's see here. Any other questions? All right, let's get back to some of my questions here. Um, so uh, where are we at here? Talked about the Rebus brand. The v okay, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the Gatsby. So started off as Volstead, mm -hmm. kind of modeled off of the Volstead Act, which made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, the ending of Prohibition, awesome. But then it transitioned to Gatsby. So... So the the Gatsby name is was because many people think that George Remus was the inspiration for, for Jay Gatsby. The, the Jay Gatsby, yeah, yeah. So that is that's where the name came from, um, and we can we can kind of go through that that history if you want, or we can just kind of leave it there. No, um, I mean I would love to go through the history. I mean I for anybody that hasn't heard it, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would definitely. Now this is the what the 2023 edition. Yes, I was not able to get a bottle of this. I do have the um, as you guys see it here. I do have the 2022, and this was this this bottle snuck up on me a little bit when I first reviewed it. I was like, man, I just wish it was. I, I think I wanted more proof out of it, but then the more I sat with it, I think to your point the more I felt like it didn't need more proof. Like mm -hmm. the flavor and the balance of this, it just got better and better and better. It was super incredible. I did a blind with this versus some other really high age whiskeys. And this one actually won out for me. So oh, awesome. yeah, it was really good. I think uh, MGP actually posted it like randomly on Instagram or something. Oh, really? Yeah, I think so. Like they had a clip of me like tasting it and I was like, nice. they're like Gatsby wins. I was like, what the hell? I didn't, yeah. I didn't know nice. that was happening. All right, so let's try this one. Yeah. I can't wait. All right, so tell us a little bit about the history here of uh, so of the Gatsby. So George Remus was um, he was born in Chicago, the son of German immigrants, and um, growing up he worked in his uncle's pharmacy. And at a at a young age, um, Jesus, he he, <laughs> he started um, you know studying pharmacy. By eighteen years old, he became a pharmacist and bought the pharmacy from his uncle. And then he decided to also uh, put himself through law school. Mm -hmm. And by the time he was 21, he passed the bar and he was a trial attorney in Chicago. And early on during Prohibition, he started representing a lot of, I feel like you going to break the glass. <laughs> uh, started representing a lot of bootlegger clients in Chicago. And he kind of thought, you know, these guys are, making a ton of money, but they're just kind of dumb hillbillies. I could do this a lot better. So he he moved down to Cincinnati because I was within a couple hundred miles of a lot of the big distilleries. He started buying up pharmacies and buying up distilleries. Right on the Ohio River too, right? Mm -hmm. So he could move that stuff. Yep. Yep. And he would he would uh, get medicinal permits to pull barrels out of the warehouses of his distilleries. And then he would, some of that would go on to his pharmacies and be sold under medicinal purposes. And some of it, uh, he would rob his own trucks, take it to a farm outside of Cincinnati, um, and bootleggers from all over the country would come pick it up. And he became the biggest um, volume bootlegger during Prohibition. So, you know, he, he quickly became very wealthy. He liked to show off that wealth. He would throw these super extravagant parties they would write about in the Cincinnati Enquirer uh, and even in national news. 
And at, at one of the parties they wrote about in the Enquirer, uh, every man in attendance had a diamond stick pin at their placemat for dinner. The women were looking around like, you know, what do we get? And um, the servants came around with little wood boxes, and inside those boxes was keys to a new car for every woman in attendance, and the driveway was lined with new cars. I did not hear that. Holy so, crap. So, yeah. so the And these were all written about in the paper. Yeah, and he, so, he was. He was a show-off. Mm -hmm. And, like, at a time where, you know, growing up in an Italian family and, you know, watching mom <laughs> movies, like, you don't show off. You keep, you keep things to yourself. You don't do that. Don't bring attention to yourself. And this guy's buying cars for women, yeah. giving guys diamonds. Oh, my God. That's crazy. Yeah. So he, uh, the legend is that he met F. Scott Fitzgerald in the basement of the Seelbach Hotel in Louisville and that they became drinking buddies and that it's it's very likely that that F. Scott Fitzgerald based Jay Gatsby off of George off Remus. Off of George Remus. And, and that's why we have the, the Remus Gatsby Reserve. And it's really our... You know, it's our that that super premium tier that is really meant to um, you know, when you have somebody over, you want that that bottle on your shelf and you got all kinds of them sitting around. But, you know, you want that bottle on your shelf that stands out that when you share that with a guest really makes that guest feel. But that bottle stands important. out, though. It's a beautiful bottle. Yeah. And I love the the way the box opens too. That's pretty. That's pretty cool too. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, our marketing team did an incredible job. The everything from the bottle, the packaging, and, yeah. and the whiskey inside is all all very special. And it it just you know it's it's great to have a bottle like that on the shelf. So that yeah, I love how yeah. Matt so eloquently just says he put a bull in his wife and brought daylight, but got away with it because she made him cray cray. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting way to put it. Um, uh yeah so if you guys haven't heard that part of the story basically george remus and i, I and i'm trying to remember some of the details here basically what he did was is he ended up going to jail but his wife didn't his wife set him up to go to jail so so he went to prison um and the federal agent that ran the investigation against him seduced his wife yeah, while, had he a, in while he was in prison and and then really um but didn't he didn't he end up going in the cell with remus or wasn't there an informant um, that george remus like told everything to and then yeah. he went mm -hmm. and then he started having an affair with his with it the was wife? the same the, yeah, sa the, the same, same guy right. okay yes. okay yeah um and, yeah. and yeah so so he um seduced george remus's wife really stole all of everything he had while yeah. he was in prison through his wife. Exactly. And then when he got out of prison, um, you know, everything was gone. He, you know, his wife was gone and um, they did not have an amicable relationship from there on. <laughs> um, you know, they, amicable. they had, um, they had hits out on each other. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, we don't, we don't like to um, <laughs> glorify that part of his history. That's not. Um, yeah. but I'm just saying, if part anybody, of his history that we yeah. like to glorify. But if anybody he, has yeah. uh, hasn't read um, mm -hmm. the Bourbon King, Gatsby. Um, I'm sorry, um, George Remus. I, it's a it's an amazing read. Um, let's see here. I have a whole video about this. It's 100 percent accurate. Maybe 80 <laughs> percent. <laughs> yeah, I, I I did a whole story on this too, uh, Maddie, and it was uh, it was the, the story was crazy. And then after he murdered his wife, he 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 goes to he goes to court and he pleads insanity, which is the same thing that he created mm -hmm. while he was a lawyer. He created that entire thing, and so he pled insanity. But he actually ended up he actually did go insane at the mm -hmm. end. So, um, yeah, just a crazy story. Remus was an absolute, he was a, he must've been a character, man. Yeah. I did not hear that part that he bought all those cars for those women. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. How the Remus story hasn't been made into a Hallmark movie. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I am a, a little surprised that it hasn't been made into a movie. It should be made into a movie. Yeah. I mean, we saw we saw his his likeness, you know, brought to life in Boardwalk Empire mm -hmm. on HBO. But I mean, honestly, just a Remus thing just warrants a movie being made in a time where where nobody could come up with original movie ideas. Mm -hmm. Everyone they're just making like remakes of shit. That movie should be made if it can be made. Yeah, just no, it should. 
wouldn't yeah. hurt the brand, I'm sure. That's right. Yeah. That's, <laughs> he's, Ian's, Ian's co-signing. He's all for it. <laughs> all right. Let's try this Gatsby here. All right. Super sweet oak on the nose. Oh, man. God, I get, again, I get like that. Man, that high age, like cherry cola note. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. So 98.1 proof. And that's cast strength. So I'm just gonna no ask water you has that. been added. That's cast, cast strength. strength for this. Mm -hmm. Wow. So was this oh man, because barrel entry proof was 120. Man, it lost a lot. Mm -hmm. Was this being aged uh in the lower floors because you were having because you wanted this to get to a higher so for this, it's interesting because normally when you hear about a whiskey this high age, a bourbon, generally it'll start mid to high. It'll kind of ramp up. And then as it gets tasted, it's like, okay, we have something special here. Mm -hmm. Then it gets like, let's see, let's keep it cooking. Mm -hmm. So let's move it down to those lower floors because we don't want it to get killed with evaporation. We don't want it to get over oaked. Was that kind of the story here or was it kind of different because just the way barrels age in Indiana? Um, it's... It's really the way barrels age, um, specifically at our distillery. So our rick houses are actually part of the levee system. Okay. Um, so they're built into Tanner's Creek, right, where it flows into the Ohio River. And the levee wall spans um, some of our rick houses. So being sitting in the river valley like that, it's very, very humid. And that humidity tends to drive the proof of the barrel down because, you know, with that partial pressure of water in the air being higher, it slows down the evaporation rate of water, but not so much of the alcohol. And that drives the proof down. Nice. Um, yeah, see, that's something I, I did not know. I mean, this is the thing that everyone's been asking. I asked him about mm -hmm. this earlier. He knows, um, you know, when is NGP going to start giving a peek behind the curtain? Like, are we going to get to... We're going to get to a point where we'll see Ross and Squibb doing some uh, distillery tours or a an abbreviated distillery tour just to see what that uh, – I mean, there's just so much history to connect to the brand. Mm -hmm. um, like we just talked about earlier, you know, the Squibb brand, the Ross brand, the, you know, Seagram's, you know, LDI, then NGP, and, and now Ross and Squibb. And just that historic landmark, you, you're saying it's – it's, you know, a little over a mile from one end to the other. I mean, I think people would go nuts to see that. Yeah. And we would love to have something for people to see. Um, there's a lot of logistic issues. You know, it was just what was built in the 1930s and they, yeah. they didn't predict that bourbon tourism was going to be a big thing. But we would love to to have more people at the distillery. Um, it it's such a unique place. It's very cool to see, um, and That's and fantastic. you know we're we're always throwing out ideas of ways to make it work. We just haven't come up with the right idea yet. So so hopefully we will eventually. But but right now we haven't. Yeah, I mean I because because as we talked about earlier, when you're connecting all these brands together. Luxco, Penelope, you guys, mm -hmm. and who else? Who knows down the road what else could happen? But I feel like a connection to these brands and for people to hear these stories and tell those stories, I mean, it could be phenomenal. I mean, I know it sucked, like, but even if you had to build some kind of visitor center from scratch with mm -hmm. kind of like a history tour, you know, maybe you kind of have like a wing for Penelope, Luxco, like all this stuff that can kind of intertwine together to tell the story of this, I think we'll just connect more people to your brand. Cause I, I feel like as great as the whiskey is, it's always like, okay, MGP, you know, a lot of people source from them. I mean, you guys have incredible whiskeys here, but that connection I think could really just make the brand take off even more and get, get some more people interested in, in uh, you know, what you're creating. Cause it's, it's fantastic whiskey. Mm -hmm. And, and, Hopefully one day we'll we'll be there. We're just all right. not there yet. I'm saying, guys. Um, all right. So 326 viewers and 172 likes. Hit that like button. Yes, please, guys. If you're hanging out right now, enjoying the conversation with Ian, please hit the like button. Appreciate everyone 
hanging out. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Um, all right. So what are you presently blending and creating yourself as a master distiller? What's your blending process like? What do you look for in a bourbon or rye? You don't, honestly, you probably can't tell us what you're blending right now as well, no. you know, for, uh, for reasons, you know, obviously, but what is your blending style? I like to ask master sodas all the time. You know, I, we've talked to Nancy Fraley a bunch of times, talked to, um, you know, Jackie Zykin when she was on uh, a lot of different blenders across, even Mike and uh, Danny, they've been mm -hmm. on the show and yeah. kind of talking about their methodology. What's your methodology when you're blending? What are those flavors? Let's talk bourbon first. When you're blending a bourbon, what do you want to accomplish if you're making a blend? Um, I mean, with the bourbon, you know, the the flavor profile that I gravitate to is generally, um, you know, with rye character. Um, I like those like darker red fruit type of flavors, the tobacco, the oak. Uh, kind of those deep barrel flavors. I'm not as much of um, on the lighter, sweeter notes. And I'm also, um, I don't really like the the more grain forward notes of like, like sometimes we call it like mashy or grain. I'm with you. With the, uh, the kind of uncooked corn, especially. Yeah, yeah I don't like that, um, that either. It, it comes off. I'm not going to say low quality because there's still some good quality, lower age, bourbons that you could try that has that that mash quality to it but I, it doesn't mean i necessarily want to taste it mm -hmm. um and then in terms of my my process so i'm <laughs> still pretty new at it um okay you know really um you know before this current role um i had a lot in, to do in sensory and quality but not so much in in blending uh, so I lean pretty heavily on our master blender, Sam Schmelzer. Um, he does a really great job and we work, we work together well. Um, but I think like, like right now, one of the things we're working on together is, is repeal eight. And I kind of find that, um, you know, picking the batches, like we kind of start picking the batches that are going to make up the core and really you're, you're kind of, to me, finding the best batches to make up that core. And then as you're going through batches and barrels, you're identifying interesting things, like like stuff that doesn't stand out on its own, but is going to add, um, you know, some complexity or, or will make good blending stock. And then from there, it's just a lot of trial, trial and error. Um, I do think one thing that's important, and I, I actually saw this quote like, on social media the other day and i don't even remember who it was but it was some filmmaker said um that that i don't make movies for you i make movies for me and i when i first read it i was like eh, that's kind of pompous but um <laughs> but but then it, it explained it and it was like you know when if you if you're trying to make a movie based on like analytics of what people like or what you think other people like then it loses a lot of its artistry and you end up making a crappy movie um, and I think the same can be said about, about blending and, and even picking barrels. Um, I think you, you got to pick what you like and create something you like. And then that artistry shines through where if you're trying to guess what other people like, then you're just, you'll never get it. Yeah. I like that. That's kind of cool. I like that. Um, Henry Turner with a great comment here. He says, we just want to travel to the Holy land of Indiana whiskey and pay our respects to the brand and have a gift shop <laughs> and distillery only releases. <laughs> I would love distillery only releases. Yeah. That's check, the, check, that's check, the biggest check. reason that I would like one. Yeah. Like distillery only release. Like mm -hmm. hell yeah. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so BT is here. Of course he has a question about Mr. Larry Eversole. Uh, do you think Larry Eversole indirectly played a role in the rye whiskey bomb? And while most people don't know who he is, how would you rank? Uh, how would you rank him in the whiskey distilling knowledge? Um, so that isn't. Uh, it's not really fair for me to rank him or comment too much on him because I never got to work with him. Larry was gone. Um, you know, I started in uh, the beginning of 2014, and and Larry was already gone at that point. Um, 
he has a tremendous amount of respect um, amongst the people that were there when he was there. Um, I know he's very knowledgeable. Um, so one of the greatest, probably the greatest rye whiskey I ever tasted was that. So BT is Brian Tracy. He used to uh, be one of the um, Brian, forgive me if I forget your title there exactly, but he was, I mean, I think he was a little bit of everything. Brian was ambassador. He was kind of, <laughs> uh, chief operating officer, social media guy. He was a little bit of everything. Uh, Brian Tracy at Sagamore. Okay. Uh, he's no longer with Sagamore. However, um, he had a bottle in his office. So Larry Eversall did a lot of consulting with Sagamore. Mm -hmm. And Larry, I forgot what the story was. There was a bunch of like this old age, like rye whiskey that was distilled. It was supposed to be sold to somebody and then it never got sold. So Larry had all these like, high age rye whiskey barrels to play with. Hmm. So he basically took a bunch and he blended, he made his own blend and he called it, what was it like Larry's rye or something BT? Is that what it was called? I forgot what the actual label said. This was like, or Ebersol rye or something like that. It was like a private blend he did. And Brian has a bottle. He had a bottle in his office wow. and I poured and got to taste this. Mm -hmm. I always thought that Booker's rye was like the greatest <laughs> rye I ever, I ever tasted that rye was the greatest rye I ever tasted. It was, uh, and Brian, if you could remind me of the ages in that bottle of what that was, that was the greatest rye whiskey I've ever tasted in my life. That thing was insane. And it was all 95.5 old school MGP rye. It was so freaking good. I've never heard of that one. I'm yeah. kind of surprised. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Oh, Nancy Fraley is in the house. This is a fantastic episode. I've been, uh, friends with former MGP master blender Pam Saul for a long time. I think she started with Seagrams in the er in the early '80s. I'd absolutely love to meet Ian one day. Yeah, if you want to. So should... we've met Nancy. <laughs> oh, Nancy! <laughs> <laughs> so we, I actually took um, one of your blending courses at an ADI a very long time ago. Yeah, yeah, and it was wait, wait, where'd you meet her at a at a ADI? Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, I took your blending course. And yeah. It's great. Um, <laughs> maybe you could help Ian uh, and Whiskey Miller friendly connect. Oh, I think they have apparently, but they need to collect. They need to connect even more <laughs> because I mean, if you're just getting started in blending, Nancy is just a, a master at blending, and I, yeah, she is just such a wealth of knowledge. Be incredible and be incredible. Um, <laughs> Michael, I'm not answering this. I'm not asking this question. <laughs> uh, let's see. Fraley in the house. Um, I want a sip of that aged Red Hook rye. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Um, yeah, BT. Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm so embarrassed. I've been blending all day, so what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, who who even knows if uh, BT has that uh, has that rye whiskey anymore? He probably drank it all, but uh, that thing was so super stupid good. Um, <laughs> Jetting drafts. Well, this is awkward. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure uh, that you have a lot of people come through your blended courses. It was in um, it was in Colorado though. That's, yeah, yeah, I do you remember that? It was in yeah. Oh my gosh. Putting it on the bucket list, me on the row. Uh, Master and Drums, uh, did Ian a pre, uh, apprentice under Mets? So were you a technical, technically an apprentice, or you just kind of worked under him um, for three years? I, mean, I guess you would technically be an apprentice, right? Yeah, we didn't like call it that, but yeah, but that's basically yeah, what it was. You were, mm -hmm. so were you kind of shadowing him most of the most of the time while you were there, or? Just in certain circumstances when he was showing you. Yeah, just in yeah. certain circumstances, but okay. I mean, working on a pretty much daily basis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Larry and you made the biggest impact on my approach to quality. Can't thank you both enough. Hope, hope all is well. Oh, nice uh, for Nancy Fraley. That's cool. Um, all right. So let's see here. Um, let's talk about your preferences and whiskey. We talked a little bit about your bourbon profile, your rye profile. You kind of talked about that. You mm -hmm. kind of like those herbal. Uh, qualities. Um, are there any ideas you have for new products and releases that you hope to release at some point? So, I mean, your, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's it's a pretty new, um, you know, pretty new position for you. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine you 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 must have so many ideas in your head. 
that you would like to work on. Mm -hmm. um, and I know you can't talk to them uh, too much, but are there any ideas that, you know, they're giving you a little latitude in order to work on yourself? Yeah, um, they, they do give me a lot of latitude. Um, we have a lot of things cooking. Um, we actually just, and, and this kind of answers a, a question that was asked a little bit ago about, um, you know, how much involvement with like Mike and Danny I have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually just had our, our kind of, you know, long-term innovation meeting and it, that's become a lot more collaborative in the last, um, in the last couple of years. I mean, this year's was the most, um, so, so I, you know, we, I present um, along with our other master distillers, Stephen Beam, uh, John Rempe, uh, Graciela Gonzalez for our tequilas, and, and then Mike and Danny. And, um, you know, we kind of all come up with our own things, but then we all get together and hash it out and critique each other. And there's a lot of collaboration there, but we're, we're all, all of us are working on a lot of, a lot of really fun stuff for the future. We just can't talk about specifics no i mean even if you can't talk about it i love the whole collaboration effort between all you guys because that's just mm -hmm. gonna especially you know when you have all those parties involved you're just gonna have the kind of really cool whiskeys coming out yeah so yeah it's yeah. fun it's fun yeah. to get to work with all of them because yeah. they all do a lot of really cool things <laughs> <laughs> no idea what you're talking about if the TTBS never met Larry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, zip it. Sorry, man. Sorry if I, if I let the cat out of the bag, but I, I, I figured if anyone's going to appreciate that story, it'd be Ian because it came from NGP or did it. Sorry. I'm all, kidding. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see here. Um, what's a fun fact about NGP slash Ross and Squib that most people don't know about? You hear about the sourcing. Mm -hmm. We know about the Remus brands, the Rossville Union. We know that the brand is being utilized by a lot of NDPs everywhere. A lot of people can't get in to see what's going on. But if, if there is one thing that stood out that was kind of a fun fact once you started, what would that be? Um, well, um, every there is a giant Christmas tree on the top of our cooker building. Um, that's kind of a fun fact. Uh, a giant Christmas tree? Yeah, we light it up, um, you know, for the holidays every year. And but it stays there all year round? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no, like, bristles on it, but it's, yeah. Uh, a Christmas tree. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, an electrician has to climb yeah. a ladder to, uh, to get it on, but uh, a, a very tall ladder. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, I touched on this earlier, but you know, our, our rick houses are part of the levee system mm -hmm. and up and down, uh, the Ohio river, you know, in Ohio, Kentucky and Indiana, there are towns very close to us that are much more populated than Lawrenceburg that do not have levee systems. Um, so there's a lot of speculation that the levee system was built because, um, you know, the federal excise tax on alcohol, we make a lot of proof gallons at the distillery. I think, uh, you know, they built that levy system most likely to protect those, those dollars, right? Yeah. I mean, um, smart, to yeah. be honest. Uh, here's a really great question. Also, with, uh, Nancy Fairley says, if you have my info, please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. I, I, have, her, I have her email address if you oh. want to reach out. But yeah, she's absolutely. actually, she's very responsive just even on Facebook and stuff like that. She's, Nancy's fairly, Nancy's incredible like that. Uh, Aaron has a great question. How does MGP's ability to provide every grain imaginable drive experimentation? Are you seeing more so you just talked about um collaboration mm -hmm. is that breeding more ex experimentation ideas uh going forward do you think, I think you so you also said you you kind of have your interest is in heritage grains mm -hmm. is that where some of that lies is it more finishes is it more blending is it a little bit of everything it's a little bit of everything yeah um but yeah i don't, I don't know um the collaboration is definitely led to more innovation i think we're we're ratcheting up our innovation and that's really driven um by the whole industry too i think yeah. the whole industry is really ratcheting up innovation you know for sure the heritage distilleries like us were um kind of slow to move um and a lot of that's because you know when you're 
in a small distillery, you you can shift a little bit faster. You shift a little bit faster, but also you you try something and it doesn't work, and it's a little bit of whiskey. If we try something and it doesn't work, it's a, a lot of whiskey. It's a lot of whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, because so, we've heard, I've heard this from every single big distiller that I've had on the show that they do. Some admitted it, some didn't, but mm -hmm. they do look a lot to the craft distillers. So there's, I'm not going to say craft distillers. I think that's kind of a a misnomer. I think a lot of people utilize that term, but I feel like all distilleries are craft distilleries. Mm -hmm. You're all making something. You're all crafting something. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to kind of do it in terms of size. A smaller distillery that doesn't have the capacity that you guys do are able, like you said, to kind of shift the mindset a little bit, try something new. Look at what Still Lawson is doing with Nancy Fraley using blue corn, red corn, mm -hmm. uh, different types of grains in that aspect. Um, do you guys look to get inspiration from them sometimes and see which of those things that you can utilize are more viable for a much more scaled up production. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we do get inspiration. Um, and we've also even collaborated with some smaller distilleries. Um, you know, some of the experimentation we've done around different, uh, heritage rye varieties, some of the, you know, we've, We've shared some of our um, research and, and smaller distilleries have shared some of their research with us. We oh, that's collaborated cool. nice. on that front as well. Okay. So there is some sharing of info there. Mm -hmm. uh, take care, Nancy. Nice to see your dinner is ready here on the West Coast. Have a good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so she'll watch the rest later. Um, Brian Mackey has a good question. Does MGP have any rickhouses that aren't the brick concrete buildings? I heard they bought a warehouse a couple of years ago. That was that held over a hundred thousand barrels. Is that true? Um, so yes, we have um, several different styles of brick houses. We have our traditional style, um, and then on site we also have some metal clad flat storage um, in both both the newest buildings on site and so when you the say oldest flat, building. So when you say site. flat storage, are you saying like you're like resting on pallets mm -hmm. stacked palletized. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Palletized. So we, we mm -hmm. have that. And then we also have some offsite storage in Kentucky and in Indiana um, as well. So we, we have a lot of different um, options to choose from, which I think kind of uh, helps from a blending standpoint. Can you say, runs... can you say how many Rick houses MGP has, or do you, are you going to make me drive around Indiana and count? Uh, you have to <laughs> drive around in the end. Damn it! <laughs> Thir thirteen on site. Thirteen on on site. On -site. Mm -hmm. Thirteen on site. Yeah. Okay. And and average, you said the older school ones, the ones that are concrete, are six floors. Mm -hmm. But then you have some newer ones there too. Or are they mm -hmm. all have those concrete variations? No, there's newer ones on site too. Okay. And then there's even the I think the oldest building on site. So. There's a couple buildings that predate Seagram, so we don't have engineering drawings for. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the oldest buildings on site, is, if not the oldest, one of the oldest two, definitely, yeah. is uh, a flat storage metal brick house as well. Uh, let's see here. Um, oh, this is actually a really good question, too, because I wondered this. I got one answer from a distiller that I talked to, but I'm wondering what your uh, what your viewpoint is. How do you think palletized changes the profile versus traditional? So upright, palletized. I know, I understand palletized is being used a lot more to save space, mm -hmm. um, which it definitely does. When you look at a palletized where, I mean, it's just endless the amount of barrels that you can palletize and mm -hmm. stack versus the traditional laying down, clocking, rolling in and out, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. well, do you feel there's a difference there or... And the the rolling in and out and the clocking is is really the biggest advantage because there, you know, we we go through great lengths to make sure the process is safe, but yeah, that's a lot of manual handling, large heavy yeah, barrels, right? For and, sure. And there's there's always going to be a risk. There's right? a lot that goes into that. Uh, so if you can handle those with fork trucks, that takes away a lot of that risk. Yeah, and if you guys um, have been on a Maker's Mark tour, they talk about clocking. They talk about because remember they're moving their barrels from top to bottom to middle, mm -hmm. you know, all the days long. So you know how much work goes into it. And so we've done, we've done quite a bit of research around it. Um, we still have a lot of research going on, but I would say that 
right now, my opinion, and this could change as, as our research goes. Okay. Um, but right now, my opinion is that the difference in individual barrels is, is typically such that it's very hard to tell the difference between a palletized or a racked barrel. So if you could take the exact same barrel, which you never get, um, and then put the exact same distillate in it and store one racked and one palletized, you would probably almost undoubtedly be able to discern some difference between the two. Really? Because just science kind of tells <clears throat> us that, right? You're, change, yeah. you're changing the headspace. You're changing, um, you know, we use four, typically use four char staves and two char heads. Uh, one of those heads is completely submerged now. And one of them's in the headspace. Um, so, so science kind of tells us there will be some difference. But the problem is that you're never going to have the exact same barrel with the exact same liquid in it because the exact same barrel doesn't exist. And the differences between the barrels are typically so much larger than whether that barrel was put on its side or on its top. Got it. And that makes it very hard to, to discern trends from, right? Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where we're at right now, but we're, we're, still looking you know we're still doing experimentation honestly that's probably the most comprehensive answer i've gotten because most people will just say oh, we don't really see a big difference but it seems like you guys are really doing the research and looking at the science behind it to mm -hmm. warrant those different to really see those differences and you know so if there are differences you'll have the data to back it up mm -hmm. um <laughs> brian tracy ngp rock summit so some many distilleries and brands would not be would not have been made for not for these guys. And their Rick houses was cold as shit in the winter. Inventory count in January is not friendly. <laughs> um, does MGP use any heat cycle to Rick houses or just mother nature or both? It's a good question. So it's mother nature. Um, <clears throat> and typically the way like our, our uh, historic Rick houses are built, um, it, it mitigates the effects of the seasons a little bit because there's so much thermal mass inside and the walls are so thick um, that, you know, during the summer, it'll never really get quite as hot inside the rickhouses as it is outside. And during the winter, it'll never really get quite as cold as it is outside. Um, so we don't do any heat cycling um, with our traditional ricks. Um, you know, we, there, there are temperatures that you don't want to really get down to mm -hmm. when you're aging whiskey because you really slow down a lot of the oxidation reactions going on in the barrel. But um, but we don't have to worry about that. Too okay. Much. All right. So grab a glass because we're gonna um, we're gonna have a little Remus Five. Okay. The the legendary bottle. All right. Everybody talks about. <laughs> I'll give you some of this. So, one of the things that you know in my research when this bottle was released was that. Technically, it was a five-year anniversary bottle, and that's why we saw some such high ages in this blend. Was that the case? Um, yes, no, maybe so. Because in reading some some different, uh, I don't even know if they were press releases, mm -hmm. but batch five was touted as an anniversary bottle mm -hmm. without any anniversary, I guess, marketing behind it. It mm -hmm. just was like a five year. It was it was the number five with like these crazy ages in this blend. Mm -hmm. And I think once this bottle happened, it kind of set the bar for every other freaking Remus <laughs> repeal mm -hmm. reserve that hit the market. So what was really the story behind Remus five? Um, <clears throat> I don't think there's that much of a story mm -hmm. behind it. It's really. Um, that that each year we want to come up with something different we don't we don't want them to be too close to each other uh we want them to be unique and and honestly the age we don't look at those years on the bottle as much as any of you all do um so we're just kind of trying to make the thing we like best. Okay. 
And if that has a bunch of 14 year old in it, great. If it has a bunch of eight year old in it, great. Um, so, so you're saying there wasn't a conscious effort to make this bottle as special as it was. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, I mean, we're trying to make it special every year and that was a, you know, the fifth year is kind of big, but yeah, but it wasn't like, Oh, we're going to put all this super old stuff in it because it's, yeah, because yeah, because right. like some of the pressure I was reading, like oh, it's the fifth year anniversary, we wanted mm -hmm. to use like high ages, and I, I don't know if that was either said. Um, Remus Five is their version of Stag Batch Twelve. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, it's easily been my favorite. I love. So we were trying some other whiskeys earlier that had kind of like this really nice, like deep, rich cherry cola note to it, mm -hmm. and I think that's where some of the some of the. Um, Older Remus batches had that, like the two and the three and the four. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what the, those are the ones that people love. Kind of the six and seven kind of went more towards like a rye heavy citrus type uh, type vibe mm -hmm. uh, with some of that cherry as well. But yeah, unfortunately, it's like this thing came out and it's been the benchmark for every damn Remus repeal release since. It kind of, yeah. it kind of ruined it. And it's not like, I don't feel like uh, we can't put out a 14 to 15 year blend every year because you have this now mm -hmm. right so this mm -hmm. is really where the high age stuff is is gonna really kind of go into and who knows what you guys have coming up in the future so yeah so i i will say that i feel like uh <laughs> six and seven have gotten a pretty unfair go at it um in some of the circles within the whiskey community um i will say that if if a comparison isn't blind, um, then I always take it with a grain of salt. And, you know, Batch 6 was second in the straight whiskey category of the Ascot Awards. Yeah. Um, and it came down to Fred kind of, I don't know if you watched it, but at the end, Fred kind of just picked one, right? Yeah, but, I'm, a, uh, I'm, a, I'm a judge in Ascot. Right? Yeah. 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 So it, I don't know if that I don't know if that bottle came across my desk though. Mm -hmm. I get I get a, all these crazy samples from them. So 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 yeah. batch six got second place in the the biggest category of the ASCAT awards. So I think a lot of people were like, oh, this was a letdown compared to batch five. Um, they got second place in the ASCAT awards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, beyond the row, we had George Remus on our whiskey row blind tonight, and it did amazing. Uh, yeah, I think George Remus, just the even the regular bourbon, does amazing. I would highly recommend putting the highest rye in so in some blinds as well. I think it always does really well. Um, is MGP kind of holding back any age brows from selling to NDPs in order to release their own brands? I mean, I'm not sure if you can really get into that. I would probably say that you guys are holding back probably some of your own higher age stuff just to put out some of your own stuff. I mean, why not? You guys have it. I yeah, could, you I have, could see. Yeah, you have I to mean, manage inventory. You have to manage um, inventory. Yeah, and and we will for the you know we can do both. Uh, um, let's see. Remus Reserve Repeal 6 and 7 were also good. I think the price increase paired with the lower ages and coming off 5 created a confluence event in people's perception. I totally agree with that. I think that's really what it was. And I agree with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but also I feel like it was a little unfair because um, you know we had, we had nearly 10% inflation that year, right? Yeah. So – Costs were increasing across the board. Whiskey was increasing across the board. If you look at, um, oh, I wish I had it pulled up, but I, <laughs> I actually, uh, from the inception of yeah, yeah. of Remus Repeal Reserve, uh, I did a inflation adjusted pricing, and and um, I believe it's gone down in price, inflation adjusted since the inception of it. Okay. Or it's like right at. So it's like right at where it should be or even lower, a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to have a little fun here before we uh, call it a night. This is the, that's the Volstead. Let's compare um, 22 to 23. Okay. Yeah. So you have one more glass back there. Mm -hmm. Grab that one. 
So this is this is the Gatsby yeah. 22. We're gonna do a little uh, comparison here. Thank you. Because I didn't get 23, and I'm tasting it now. I did not get to. <laughs> oh, did not get to. Oh, did not get to. I got it. It's right here. Did not get yeah, to do that uh, comparison. So I'm gonna oh, man. I want do it now. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. Ooh. I think I yeah A W I would probably agree. I think I like six over seven. I I enjoyed six. I don't think six was anything to you know shake a stick at. I thought it was actually really good. <laughs> so we're going to do employees get a bottle of every release. <laughs> uh, I would imagine every employee at MGP are probably not all whiskey drinkers. That's true. There's a lot that aren't. Yeah. Um, there's been some uh, yeah some non whiskey drinkers. To go through some pretty high positions at MGP. Um, yeah. But no, unfortunately, we don't get a bottle of it really. Does MGP intentionally put emphasis on... Oh, this is a great question. Uh, on transparency, it seems like most NDPs that source from Indiana are quick to name the source and age, looking at you, National Barrel Company, and Redline. It's actually a really good question because it feels like in a, in a world now where there's a lot of source products with, you know... Uh, you know, you have those agreements where, you know, you have to, you can't say anything about where you're getting your whiskey. Mm -hmm. MGP seems to be like, yeah, tell them exactly where you got it. Is that a conscious decision or has that just been something that you guys have been doing for so long and you're just not going to change it? Um, so that, so we don't really do that. Um, we are kind of whole thing is, um, that once you buy that whiskey from us, it's your whiskey. And you tell that story however you want to tell it. So we don't talk about our customers. Because um, there are some NDPs that exist. And, and it's not my place to talk about, you know, any of the brands that are buying whiskey from us. That's their story to tell. And I don't want to tell it wrong. And it's just Well, I mean, let's be honest. Say it. Let's so be honest. I'm gonna. That, yeah. I'm, let's be honest. Some of those stories are bullshit, and they could be. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so it's more on whether or not that person, um, that label buying our whiskey, wants to tell that story or not. We're not necessarily telling them to to yell it from the mountaintops or keep it quiet. We're saying it's your whiskey. You you tell your story. But I think that's still a great decision mm -hmm. because you're giving them the, you're making this, you're giving them this, oh, sorry. You're giving them a decision. You're telling mm -hmm. them that you're buying it, sure, whiskey, tell your story. Mm -hmm. You want to put MGP on the back, go for it. If you mm -hmm. don't, that's your decision. Mm -hmm. But most people will. They'll put that MGP on the back. And I think that gives some people some latitude as far as like the quality they're getting in the bottle. Mm -hmm. I think when it gets down to it, like we said, some of the stories are very contrived, but I understand that there's a marketing aspect to new brands, and you have to make your whiskey stand out, yeah. no matter what you what you have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I think there are some real stories, and you know whether or not you're using that whiskey. There you go. Yeah, and I think for the most part we've come. We're, you know, I think we're kind of worn as a badge of honor for a lot of the NPDs. You know, I think they they were a sign of quality so yeah because like just like i said in a world of ndas uh, you can't tell anybody where we're getting it from mm -hmm. it's like you guys you're you're just on every label it's kind of nice all right so nose which one do you like better um, i'm leaning towards 23. i'm leaning towards 23 as well because <clears throat> it's a little there's an extra little bit of level of again it's like that sweet that sweet cherry cola note. I think that the, <clears throat> and I, I don't want to say that the 22 is, is tannic because it's not, but those, those tannins are a little, a little more in the edging on bittery, yeah. a little sharper. Definitely. Where, where this is a little sweeter and creamier. Yes. A little more. Oh yeah. Real quick before I did want to ask you that one question that we talked about upstairs. And I think someone brought it up in the chat. When you're blending, mm -hmm. 
you have a whiskey, it seems great, but it's thin. How do you manage the viscosity of a whiskey? Or just, just even from the beginning, like say you, you try a barrel and man, it's good and it's so viscous. I want to utilize this in my next blend. How do you kind of manage the viscosity and keep it? Is there a method and madness to do that? Are you still kind of learning how to do that yourself? Because like you said, you are kind of you, you are kind of starting out or, or just kind of making your way through the whole blending process. To me, there's not necessarily a way to manage it. Um, but as you're going through that whole <laughs> blending process, you are evaluating every blend, you know, based on aroma, um, you know, flavor, uh, mouthfeel. So, Oof. so if, if we got a blend that we really liked and we wanted to add more mouthfeel, we would then select batches that had really good mouthfeel, but then you're going to change the flavor, right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's a tricky. So yeah. So, so are you? So you're just more like you're going to work on a blend, and if it happens to have that really good mouthfeel, then it's kind of a plus one. No, it's not. It's not a plus one because that's a consideration. Okay. Creating the blend. Oh, okay. Good. So, so it's a consideration the whole way. So through. yeah. So it's not just flavor. You yeah. are looking for mm -hmm. a specific texture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. For sure. Um, palette. Where are you leaning? I think the nose matches the palette in this aspect as far as which one's sweeter versus which one is a little bit more like you said, a little bit more tannic, a little bit more oak forward, borderline bitter. But still some nice sweet oak on the 22 versus the 23. To me, that's a little bit sweeter. Yeah. I don't, I like the funkiness. I would agree. And um, I like the funkiness of the 22, though. It's, mm -hmm. it's weirdly funky. It's different. I don't know. I think 23 would probably be like the, the crowd hit. Yeah. But the 22 would be kind of like a whiskey geeks. Like this is kind of funky and good, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, let's see if an NDP started today, wanted to use MGP. Are they getting any age whiskeys or just new make? Is there a waiting list? Yeah, Adam, we kind of spoke about that earlier. Um, I mean, there probably is a, a long list of, of folks to get into the door for when it comes to uh, sourcing from MGP. It is. It's. It's. But you did say that, you know, at some points, you, know, you guys are kind of seeking out some NDPs to see if they want stuff, and people are knocking the door. But you don't really have a good insight to that. Yeah, we're. I'm. I'm not in our distilling solutions sales um, discussions often. Yeah. No. Um. I don't know if you could say this. What's the? Give me a range of the oldest whiskeys you have aging right now. Oh, um, can you say, and I don't care if it's light whiskey, I don't care, whatever it is. What, what's that age that you guys have? That's probably really up there. I mean, do you have anything in the twenties? Um, I can't really say, I, um, but there's, there's, there's older things aging. Uh, <laughs> older things aging. Yeah. All right. There's older, there's older mm -hmm. things aging. So yes, they have probably twenty something year olds getting there, maybe even higher. Holy but. crap! Oh man. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, it's eleven oh three. All right, guys. I think uh, with that, um, we're gonna ask him one more question. Uh, how do you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I knew this was coming because I saw you knew it was he knew it was coming. Yeah. Um, so what's your ultimate peanut butter and jelly sandwich? So you'll probably make fun of me. The guys at the distillery um, make fun of the way I eat a lot. Um, <laughs> this is going to be good. But but um, but I would probably get it. The, I really like the angelic bread. It's like sprouted grain bread. It's good. Um, <laughs> OK. And then my my grandma toasted or untoasted. Untoasted. Okay. Um, my grandma used to make the best blackberry jam. Oh, blackberry. Uh, mm -hmm. I've heard blackberry a couple times. So you're probably like the third or fourth person that has said blackberry. Yeah. Is it still her jam or you just always seek out blackberry jam? Um, 
if I if I can get my hands on her jam, uh, it's still her jam. <laughs> Unfortunately, she moved away from the Blackberry patches a while ago. Ah, oh, damn. Um, <laughs> and then and then for peanut butter, um, I would probably sub um, sub out cashew butter because I think it's the superior nut butter, but. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'd probably go cashew butter. All right. So nobody has said cashew butter ever. So yeah. you're the first one <laughs> that has said cashew butter. <laughs> All right. Angelic bread. I'm going to have to Google that shit. I don't mm. know what angelic bread is. So angelic bread, blackberry, and um, uh, cashew butter. Smooth yeah. or crunchy? Um, Crunchy. Crunchy. Okay. I'm a crunchy guy too. All right. There you guys have it. Um, and with that... I want to thank uh, Ian Sturston for coming on the channel. Dude, this was such an awesome conversation. Thanks for coming in studio, driving all this way to be here and uh, answering all these amazing questions for everybody. Um, <laughs> cashews and sprout bread. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I love you guys. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out. Remember, check out the links uh, for the... Um, uh, for the GoFundMe uh, fundraisers for St. Jude's and also for Nationwide Children's Hospital. Remember, next week right here live, Fred Minnick uh, going to be uh, crowning a new champion for Blend again in 2023. I know we're in 2024, but uh, it, sorry it was delayed a little bit this year, but it's still going to be a fantastic time next week. So cheers. See you next week right here for a very big night on the Mash and Drum. Cheers to Ian Sturzman, MGP, what they're doing, Ross and Squibb. Thanks for everybody watching, and we'll see you next time right here on the Master Drum. Cheers, folks.